Good morning. How's everyone? Uh, let's just take a moment. How many know you can be in the same house but not in the same room? <laughs> it happens at your house. So we have folks that are part of our church family not in the room today. They are watching online this morning, either online or on demand. Can we just make a little bit of noise and tell them we're glad that they're joining us today? And I just wanted to say uh, thank you for those who chose to take their faith public last week. We had water baptisms. We had the, the baptistry outside in the, the uh, lower parking lot, and people gathered on the hill and watched them affirm their faith. And it was just an incredible day. I'm so glad for those who participated in water baptism and for those of you who witnessed that. It was a great day. Uh, we're, we're in one of the more challenging stories to try to tackle in all of Scripture, and it's when uh, two people evidently got struck dead in church. And uh, so uh, there's not a lot of uh, interest in looking at a story like this. Uh, and quite honestly, there's a lot of commentary about it that it makes you wonder what God is doing. So let's try to tackle this. We're actually going to begin at the end of chapter 4 in the book of Acts because that's where this story actually starts. And then it moves into chapter 5. So beginning in the 32nd verse of Acts chapter 4, all the believers were in one heart and mind, and no one claimed any of their possessions was their own. But they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now continuing into Acts chapter 5, now a man named Ananias together with his wife Sapphira also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings but to God. And when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. No kidding. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price that you and Ananias got for the land. Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one dared join themselves, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits. And all of them were healed. So last week we looked at a passage where the place was shaken after they prayed. Today we're looking at a passage where the people were shaken. When we think about fellowship, it's perfectly appropriate to think about fellowship in terms of ex 
acceptance. That's a significant part of, of what it means to be part of a family, part of a family of faith. But it also means accountability. And what we see is accountability is brought into the acceptance of the church in this passage. In this church, everyone was cared for. And that didn't mean that everyone who attended the church had lots of money. It just means that if you had a need, it was taken care of. And from time to time. So it wasn't a regular calendarized event. It, it wasn't even necessarily uh, recommended by the apostles. But it seems as though people, when they would see a need, would sell a property or some land, maybe a house, and they would bring the money and give it to the uh, apostles for distribution. And, and some people will wonder, well, why would they give it to the apostles to distribute? And, and the answer is, is that when someone gives you something personally, you often feel indebted to them. And they only wanted their sense of debt to be to God, not to individuals who helped them out of a difficult situation. And so they, they would sell these houses and lands, which, I mean, you know how important your house is to you if you own a house. Can you imagine selling that for someone else? Back in that day, they didn't have banks like we do. That's a relatively modern invention. And, and so it represented their wealth, their savings. It, it, this, they weren't just giving out of their income that they were producing. They were actually giving out of their savings. The way you transferred wealth in the ancient world from generation to generation was through property. And most people didn't have multiple houses to live in. So if you sold a house, you either downsized or you were couch surfing at someone else's house. So this is what this group of people are willing to do. And there's a guy named Joseph, and he's got a nickname. His nickname is Barnabas because it means son of encouragement. And uh, he's a Levite. This is interesting. And he sells a piece of property, he sells a field, and he brings all the money in, and he lays it at the apostles' feet, and they distribute it to care for the poor. And it just sent shockwaves throughout the community, a, a kind of radical generosity that people had not witnessed before. By the way, there are some people who, uh, they refer to a passage of scripture where Jesus says, you know, you're not supposed to let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, and, and, and some people don't like to keep track of their contributions. This actually would indicate that, that they didn't consider that a violation. They knew who gave the money. They know how much money was given and, and for the purpose that it was given. And uh, what's interesting here is uh, there's a little bit of uh, question raised in some of the commentaries about uh, this guy nicknamed Barnabas. And that He's a Levite that owns property, and if he owned property in Israel, that was considered illegal. So we do know he was from, from Cyprus, so maybe he had property there. Or if he owned property in Israel, maybe out of his desire to be obedient to God, he just sold the property so that he would be in keeping with the law. And then what would happen is he took the proceeds of that and just distributed it. He didn't want to personally benefit. So it could have been an act of repentance. But everyone was just overwhelmed, and it kind of set a new standard of radical generosity. And, 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 and being inspired to be something that you're not is not a problem. But pretending to be something that you're not is a huge problem. Ananias and Sapphira were inspired, but not to be generous. They were inspired to appear to be generous. That's the distinction. So they said that they would sell a property and donate all of the proceeds, but their intention was to only give a portion. I don't know when they decided that. Maybe they got a lot more for the property than they thought it was worth. And then said, well, we're not giving all of that away. The sin was not stealing. The sin was deception. And we just read the story. They actually don't survive this event, which makes modern people very uncomfortable. Does, does God show up in churches and kill people for things that they shouldn't be doing? And uh, that's not the point of the story. In fact, if we don't understand this story, you will misunderstand God. We have to understand this story. Ananias and Sapphira didn't give to help others. They gave to help themselves. They weren't trying to honor the poor. They were trying to bring honor to themselves. 
and they were willing to use deception to do that. So what is the kind of giving that God will not tolerate? The kind of giving God will not tolerate is giving a false impression. That's the giving God will not tolerate. And this story is not a threat. It's an insight. And without a pastor's heart, you can read tone into Peter's language. You know, uh, it's amazing how much tone we add to text. And I don't think Peter is angry here. I don't think he's frustrated with them. And by the way, I don't think he's responsible for their death. So, well, he predicted the death of Sapphira. Predicting and causing are not the same thing. And so he just knew what was going to happen next. But his heart is broken by what they've done. You can go back and reread the words of Peter and put it in a sorrowful and pleading tone and watch how much difference those words take on in meaning. So many inter interpret the story to, to basically say, uh, you need to be very afraid of God. And there's actually a passage in the Bible that says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, so you really need to be terrified about God. Is, is that the meaning of this passage? Is, does God want us to be terrified by him, terrorized by what he could do to us? And that's not the meaning of this word. Um, at some point in your life, this probably happened to you, and if you're a parent, it's probably happened to your children. And that is that as you were growing up, you got to a certain age and you knew what the expectations of your parents were. They had given you very clear direction. It wasn't ambiguous at all what was expected. But you were with a circle of friends and you decided that you were more interested in doing what they wanted than what your parents wanted. All right, let's just check. Did that happen to anybody in the room besides me? Okay, three or four of you, that's great. And uh, the rest of you, it, it'll happen eventually. And, and when you're a parent and kids do this, it's, it's very frustrating. What's going on? What's happening is they care more about the opinions of their friends than they do of their parents. That's what means more to them. They're more afraid of disappointing their friends than they are of disappointing their parents. It has to do with a kind of respect. And that's what this concept of fear is. God is not wanting us to walk in every Sunday wondering if we're going to survive the event. Uh, God wants us to walk in actually more concerned about what he wants for our lives and being more concerned that we could disappoint him than disappoint someone else. It's good to want to be a better person. There's lots of growth opportunities if we understand where we are weak and where our wounds are, where we're failing. So the church is to be a safe place to be honest about yourself. That's the meaning behind this message. We have to have a place where we can be honest about ourselves. That requires humility. And that requires courage. If you're going to be honest about yourself, it, it, it's humbling and it requires courage. And that means that you become vulnerable because people can make their own assessments about you. Pretending removes every single safety net God has set up in the church. It, it's like a trapeze. How many have ever seen a circus where a trapeze artist kind of swinging out on a bar and sometimes they'll do it without a net? Pretending isn't just swinging out on a trapeze bar without a net. It's swinging out on a trapeze bar without a net and no one to catch you. That's what it is. That God has put into the church these safety nets so that we can be humble and we can be vulnerable and the experience does not destroy us. Pretending removes every option for accountability. You can't be accountable if you're pretending that what's true about you isn't true. And there's no opportunity for growth. You can't grow if you're actually denying the thing that needs to be addressed. James 5, 6 says this. It says, confess your faults to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The natural human tendency is to hide our faults. Scripture says we need a place where it is safe for us to confess our faults because that's how we actually get better not just feel better 
So not everybody thinks this is an attractive option. The human tendency is to look for people that you like and then pretend you fit in with them. And when we don't feel accepted, the human tendency is to find fault with them because we don't want to think it's our fault we're not part of the group. So that way we can leave feeling like they just weren't who they said they were. This story actually tackles our motives. It's not about money. It's about our motives. And our motives reveal the why. Your motive reveals who you are serving. And Ananias and Sapphira were not serving the poor, and they were not serving church, and they were not serving God. They were serving themselves. The goal of the church is not to impress others. The goal of the church is to be obedient to God. We're not here to impress a world. We're here to be obedient to God. And as it turns out, when you lift Jesus up, other people are drawn to him. Amen? So can you commit, make a commitment, without using that commitment to elevate your status? Can you be generous without using your generosity to, to increase your influence? That's what this passage goes after. Uh, we, we will face a couple t temptations if we attempt to do this. The first is, we'll be tempted to hide the truth about ourselves. So the tendency then is to live out of our hiding. There's a, there's a way to go about that. Just Have you ever thought about this? What if Ananias and Sapphira had been successful in their effort? Well, they would have had to hide even more because they hadn't changed at all. And... That's a very rough way to live. Um, they have to live in comparison mode, constantly seeing if someone has more honor than what they do, and then what do I have to do in order to be considered in their eyes as equal? If you hunger for Jesus, you will be filled, but if you hunger for other people's approval, you will always feel like you're starving. This is how our world works. The second temptation is to use what you have been given to obtain what you have not been given. You know, we all know that our salvation is a result of grace, but we often think that our growth is a result of our own works. The wisdom, the knowledge, the discernment that is required for us to grow are also gifts from God. It requires us to be humble. It requires us to be vulnerable. And here's the thing about being vulnerable. The moment you become humble and vulnerable, it's like an anti-invisibility cloak. That's how you are seen. As long as you are pretending, you, the real you is invisible. And you cannot feel accepted when you're hiding. And it is very easy to do this in religious environments. When we live out of our hiding, we avoid any accountability. I don't want people to speak into my life about things that I'm struggling with or that I feel broken by. So that means I have to limit my access. Pretending takes an incredible amount of energy, an incredible amount of strength. And the result is, is you will get very fatigued. So the question is, are you willing to allow other people into your life? And then when we live out of hiding, we also avoid growth. Pretending is like a pesticide or a herbicide to your soul. It kills it. Please hear this. Ananias and Sapphira... It's not a unique thing that happened because they deceived and pretended. It was just an accelerated example of it. Every time we pretend, something inside of our soul is dying. All the time. So we can't overcome what we won't acknowledge. If we're afraid of rejection, we're not going to get better by never acknowledging that. If we're, if we're afraid of disapproval, we're not going to get better without letting people into our lives and speak into our lives. If we're afraid of someone retaliating against us, we're not going to get better by keeping our distance. If we're afraid of loss, we're not going to get better by holding on to what we have. If we're afraid of anger, we're not going to get better by trying to intimidate others. You know, we, There's a way to live so that you can let people know, if I get angry, you won't like it. And so you can get people to kind of walk on eggshells around you. And you can, 
But while you're doing it, something inside of you is dying. So the story actually reveals something of the generosity of God and the grace of God. And it's hard to imagine that when we see two people carried out of a church service. But God is actually more generous than anyone in this story, and he's more generous than anyone in this room. He's the one who gave his son, who gave his life, so that all of our faults and all of our failures could be forgiven. He gives the gift of forgiveness. That's the gift. He gives the gift of provision. What you have in your life is a result of what he has opened doors for you. He gives opportunity. He gives skills and talents and abilities. He gives coaching, leading in our lives. And here's what we need to see. And this is absolutely fascinating. I'll ask the worship team to come out now. Uh, when the church refuses to pretend, people actually get better. When the church refuses to pretend, people actually get better. That's how the story ends, right? It's not an accident. The church decides we're not pretending anything anymore. We're going to be honest. And the result is, is even in the surrounding towns, they start bringing all kinds of people who are sick and people who are under the bondage of impure spirits. And the Bible says that all of them, all of them, all of them were healed. Not because the people in the room were perfect, it's because the people in the room wouldn't pretend anything anymore. The reputation of the church flowed out of the stories of changed lives, not their PR. So pretending is dying. Whatever you're hiding and whatever you're pretending, it's killing you right now. It might not be so dramatic that you fall over in the service and we have to have people carry you out. So if you want to stop pretending and start growing, how do you go about that? Maybe you want to grow in character. You want to be a person whose words and actions are the same. You could invite feedback into your life. You could give permission to people and ask their, their opinion. Do you see any evidence that when I say this and I do this, that they're not the same thing? Because I don't want to pretend. I want to know. Graciousness. Maybe you want to grow in graciousness. There's a lot of angry ranting and short sentences. And when was, when was the last time we, we saw something kind and generous go viral? It happens, but it's rare. Think of a better way to respond. Maybe you could bring somebody else into that conversation too. I, I want to address this. Is there a better way to do it? Discernment. Maybe that's what you need. To make less judgments just about the surface things of what you see and to better understand what's going on beneath the surface. Maybe you want to grow in your understanding of Scripture, which surprisingly enough will take more than just listening to me talk on a Sunday. You're going to have to spend time in this book for yourself. And you need to be in conversations about it where you not only speak, but you also listen. And when the church does this, the story of changed lives start reverberating out. And people in our culture who are sick and wounded and captivated by desires and patterns and compulsions that they can't control, they think, could it possibly be true where there's a safe place I don't have to hide? And God can change my life. That's the story of Acts chapter 5. Would you bow your heads with me today? So I'm going to go through that list real quick again, and I want you to think of a name if that list applies to you. If you want to grow in your character, who's someone you could talk to as soon as possible, maybe even today. Say, this matters to me. I want to invite you into my life. Graciousness, to, 
the capacity to not have to be the sharpest tongue or the quickest response in the room, to learn to pause. Discernment. If you want to be more discerning, do more listening. By the way, it helps to listen to people who don't always agree with you. Scripture. Who could you have a conversation with? You know, life groups is a great opportunity for this. Heavenly Father, the truth is we have much to hide and you've told us we don't have to because you are the most generous, gracious, kind, giving being in the universe and because you have already accepted us. We don't have to strive for anything else. Work in us, work through us by your grace today. In Jesus' name, amen.